Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name's Laura and I'm part of the marketing team here at Creed. Um, I'm going to run through some housekeeping before we get started. And then as we've got quite a, a packed um, session for you today, we've got a lot to pack into 60 minutes. Uh, we will get going. So thank you for joining us. Um, hope you find this webinar really informative. Our aim is that after this session, you feel confident in understanding the new regulation, why it's being introduced and the steps that you need to take moving forward. So we'll aim to get through everything in an hour and hopefully we'll have around 10 minutes at the end of the session to answer any questions. Um, if you do want to answer questions, just pop those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll aim to pick them up at the end and um, a few of the speakers might kind of get back to you and reply to those throughout the webinar as well. Uh, we are recording, so you'll automatically receive a recording to this um, tomorrow, along with some uh, links to some additional helpful resources as well. So we've got some fantastic speakers with us today, all experts in their fields. Um, and first off, kicking, up, kicking off for us today, we have got Andrew Hodgson from CGA. Andrew is a client manager specialising in the food service industry. And if you don't know, CGA are the data and insight experts who translate a wide range of complex data sources to provide businesses the headroom for growth opportunities and engaging sales stories. So a lot of the data, statistics and insight that Creed share come from reports um, that we get from CGA. So they're a great partner um, that we are working with. Andy is going to run through some timely data and give us insight into how consumers and business leaders are feeling right now. So Andy is going to um, talk through for about 10 minutes um, and hopefully you find a lot of this data really helpful and gives you an understanding of what consumers are thinking and feeling right now. So without further ado, I will pass over to Andy, if you'd like to share your screen, Andy. Yep, thanks a lot there, Laura, and good morning there, everyone. Why is it here? Yeah, so just to set the scene for the webinar today, I'm going to be taking you through a short overview and um, looking into the current out-of-home market um, and how it's performing and plans from business leaders moving forward for 2021 and beyond. I'm also going to be looking into consumer sentiment as the return to the out of home and what their expectancies are now as we head down that road to recovery. And some, also some of the trends that we've seen evolve throughout the pandemic that both suppliers and operators need to be aware of moving forward. So where is the market now? So through our partnership with UK Hospitality, we have a quarterly tracker which showcases how much the sector is worth in value. And we do this on both a quarterly and an annual basis. And as we can see here on this slide, the severity of the pandemic is clear with a loss of £80.8 billion worth of sales into the sector within the last 12 months. And we can see again here the sheer impact that the pandemic has had with over 9,000 licensed premises in the UK shutting down due to the financial constraints that they've faced throughout the last year. And when I say licensed, I mean anywhere that sells alcohol, such as pubs, bars, restaurants and hotels, for example. But on a positive note, it isn't all doom and gloom. So from our recent business leader survey that we released in March this year, which surveys the opinions of leaders from the UK's major operators, nearly three in five are still planning to invest in opening new sites within the coming year. So whilst there has been that real hardship for many businesses, there's clearly opportunities to work with those businesses that are clearly looking to grow and invest within the coming months. Our most recent business confidence survey shows that confidence is back with business leaders to actually an even higher level than it was prior to the impact of COVID-19. So when we take a look at this slide, the blue line is business leader confidence in the general market, with the yellow line above showing confidence in their own business. And as we can actually see, it's at the highest level since April 2020 before the pandemic hit. So that's really positive news moving forward. After the first phase of reopening, we saw pubs return in significantly higher numbers compared to restaurants in April. And the reason why many restaurants have struggled to open was just due to the lack of outside space. So for many pubs, they might have like gardens or even car park spaces, which allowed them to adapt and to allow consumers onto their sites whilst actually abiding to the government guidelines. We also saw some really great examples of restaurants who, upon agreements with their local councils, 
put tables outside. So we saw this close to us at CGA um, in Manchester in the Northern Quarter area, where due to its actual success, it's led to the City Council actually fully pedestrianising the area. So that's one of the real success stories that's come from this. But what we did see as well is that many outlets waited until the 17th of May when consumers could return indoors. Three quarters of licensed premises, they were trading in May, which is really positive news for the sector, especially when we consider how difficult the last year has been. However, there's definitely still work to be done to get the sector back to those pre-pandemic levels. And again, despite those unbelievable challenges that the sector's faced with the numerous lockdowns and restrictions as to where consumers can interact within their outlets, 70% of business leaders are expecting to return to profit by the end of the year, which again is, is really good to hear. So what are the changes that we're seeing in consumers as they start returning to the sector? So as we head down that road to recovery, we can see that optimism is, is beginning to grow with consumers as the market carefully reopens and consumers are starting to get back some of their freedoms. But what I think is quite fair to say is that this optimism is probably slightly inflated when we compare it to this time last year or six months ago, just due to the unbelievable turmoil that obviously everybody's experienced that nobody was obviously prepared for before the pandemic hit. This optimism is further highlighted when we asked about their expected frequency of visit and spend, with more than a quarter of consumers planning to go out more than they did pre-COVID, and less than one in five planning to go out less. Similarly, 22% are actually planning to spend more when they do go out. And what I think is really important is understanding which consumers are planning this potential increase in both frequency and spend, and how to get those people into your venues. That's going to be vitally important to the success of the remainder of the year. And what we can see as well is that the impact of the pandemic has really made consumers reflect, with 65% agreeing that the coronavirus has made them realise they need to live in the moment, with also half of consumers wanting to go out at every opportunity as well. So we've definitely seen from our data, obviously, with the restrictions that have been placed on everyone, consumers are clearly eager to get back. There's that pent-up demand, and they're going to go out, as we can see here, at every opportunity. And the importance of health for consumers is growing year on year as well. And I think this is fueled in part by concerns around the impact of COVID-19 on long-term health. So what we can see on the stat on the left here is that 72% of GB consumers are trying to lead a healthy lifestyle. And that's up four performance points versus the survey we did a year previous. And also 92% of GB consumers are taking precautions to protect their health as a result of COVID-19. And this growing emphasis on health from consumers was evident from a question that we have in our Food Insights report that we're actually releasing this week. And when we asked what encouraged consumers to try new trends, 30% are encouraged to try new trends if they're healthy alternatives. So it's not only just important to have healthy alternatives, it's obviously important as well that on the menus you're putting a creative healthy alternative as well, having those creative offerings that will attract consumers to try those options. And we can see that cleanliness and safety have increased in importance for consumers as well due to the impact of COVID-19. So again, it's vitally important to ensure that consumers are feeling reassured and feel safe in outlets as we head down that road to recovery. That's going to be essential in rebuilding consumer confidence and therefore retaining those future visits as well. In the next section of the presentation, I'm going to be taking you through some of the key trends that you may well have been familiar of prior to COVID-19. However, as a result of the pandemic, they've become even more prominent. So when we look at the factors that business leaders expected to be vital for 2021, it was elements associated with quality that have really jumped in importance. And that probably aligns with the factors that makes the sector as unique as it is. You could argue that maybe value offerings, they can be somewhat replicated at home, but certainly the quality of experience that you get in the out of home and that service as well, they're two factors which I think are fairly exclusive to hospitality. And as we can see here, they've, they've jumped in importance since last year as well. And we can see that product quality is a key factor that would contribute towards a good experience for customers. So again, ensuring that you can provide those high quality products to the sector, that's certainly going to help the customers that you supply into and help them meet that demand and expectancy from consumers in the app of home. And what we can see as well is that online pre-booking, that's certainly something that's here to stay. So whether consumers liked it or not prior to the pandemic, it's definitely become a normal part of what's now expected in both the pre-going out of home experience and also whilst out in venues as well. And we expect that to continue moving forward. 
What we saw as well was a really huge drive towards localism as a result of COVID-19. So whilst many businesses faced obviously the severe financial struggle and restrictions were implemented on travel, communities really rallied to try and support establishments close to the doorstep. And as we can see on this slide, changes to working patterns, that's certainly something that's going to have an effect on how consumers interact with the out of home. Over two thirds of consumers who can work from home actually predict that they continue to do so beyond the pandemic. And that's certainly gonna have real positive effects for local trade, but certainly obviously as a consequence of that, less positive for towns and city centres who really rely on those workers commuting in. And this is reflected with over a third of GB consumers who actually plan to visit city centres less frequently than they did before the coronavirus outbreak. And obviously we're aware that city centres have really experienced that impact what we do anticipate, however, is that this will improve and slowly return back to pre-pandemic levels. In our business leader survey that we did at the beginning of last year in 2020, leaders predicted delivery to be a real area of growth where they saw the opportunity to invest in their businesses moving forward. I think, quite frankly, they couldn't have ever really predicted the huge rise of engagement with delivery. And obviously, with the restrictions in place throughout the numerous lockdowns, Delivery came, became, for many businesses, actually their only opportunity to bring in some form of revenue. And I think moving forward, businesses have actually found that revenue opportunity that they maybe never used before. It was maybe kind of forced upon them due to the pandemic. And it's definitely something that we believe that they will continue and, and keep this going moving forward. And like I say, delivery is definitely a macro trend that we believe is here to stay. As we can see, of those who actually ordered delivery for the first time or more often than they usually would, 70% are actually looking to continue their frequency of order and takeaways and delivery. And again, I think what we're going to see with consumers is it's definitely become a habit that they're going to continue to do beyond COVID-19. And a really good sign for the UK is how people have actually taken those on-premise behaviours into the lockdowns and beyond. So we saw the trade up to cooking at home, for example, through restaurants, businesses who provided those cook at home kits. And I think that's, again, been one of the real success stories um, of this like, pandemic. And again, I think what it shows is that consumers are not ready to give up on that restaurant quality food. Despite being in lockdowns, they're going to continue to pay for it, as we can see here. With the average amount there's, there's a good revenue opportunity there especially if we end up going into future lockdowns co consumers are willing to keep re-engaging with the restaurants or different operators when they can't actually go physically and what we can see as well hospitality at home that's remained dramatically higher in may versus 2019 and whilst we believe the core of hospitality is in venue again we believe that hospitality at home is, is certainly here to stay and what we've also seen is a huge rise in the expectancy from consumers for the brands that they visit to be sourcing both environmentally friendly packaging and also ingredients within their products. And again, this demand, that's going to come from operators who will be looking for that support from the companies that supply into them. So being aware of this and catering for this need, that's certainly going to help, your com help you get ahead of the competitors and meet that rising consumer demand. And we saw as well the importance of locally and ethically sourced food to consumers in our Food Insights report, with over two thirds of GB consumers stating that it's important to either have locally sourced food or ethically sourced food to them when obviously eating out. And what we can see as well is that two in five consumers are actually willing to pay extra for their meal if the ingredients are sustainably sourced. So again, you can see there's definitely a revenue opportunity for looking to get those sustainably sourced ingredients in your outlets. So just to review the presentation, um, what we can see is that the hospitality sector has lost £80 billion worth of revenue throughout the pandemic, and in net terms, over 9,000 venues. Despite this, there's clearly an optimism from business leaders, and we're expecting new openings and fresh investments within the coming year. What we can see as well is that consumers are driven by getting really good quality in the out of home. So it's really important to make sure they're catering for that. And they also want to feel safe and reassured when they go out. And that's going to be vital in rebuilding that consumer confidence and retaining those future visits. As well with trends such as localism, that digital customer journey and delivery, they've all become even more prominent due to the pandemic. And they're certainly here to stay once we're beyond this. As well, consumers, they're clearly becoming more health aware and are thinking about their environmental footprint when visiting the out of home. And again, operators and suppliers need to be aware of this. This is only going to grow and they need to make sure that they're ahead of their competitors to cater for this consumer demand. And then finally, consumers are clearly eager to return and that pent up demand, having had all the freedoms taken away, it means that consumers really now want to get back as much as they can and re-engage with the out of home. And when they do that, they're willing to treat themselves and spend even more doing it as well. And that's the end of that presentation. So I'll stop sharing my screen now, Laura. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. Um, a lot of information in there for sure. Um, and I know from a personal perspective, I can definitely relate with a lot of those um, consumer statistics. So I think it will absolutely be worth everyone um, watching the recording back and kind of digesting all of that data and insights again, um, definitely. So next, I'm going to hand over to um, Dr. Hazel Gowland from Allergy Action. Hazel is a food allergy advocate, researcher, consultant and trainer, and she um, just absolutely lives and breathes everything to do with and surrounding allergens. So Hazel is going to run through Natasha's law, the actual specifics, exactly what it means, the products it affects and the changes that you will have to make. So I will just um, share my screen. And Hazel, over to you. Thank you, Laura. That's lovely. Thank you for the kind welcome for inviting me to talk this morning. Um, yes, this is a, a short presentation about Natasha's Law. Um, and let me just make sure that it works. Well, there we are. So, the background to what is called Natasha's Law. Natasha's Law is actually an amendment to the uh, Food Information Regulation from 2014 um, throughout the UK, uh, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England. Following a tragedy, uh, Natasha's Law is so called because we lost this young lady, Natasha Ednan Laperouse, um, who was 15. She was travelling from Heathrow to France with a with her father and a friend and they got some food at uh, Terminal 5 um, from the open plan counter there. There was a long queue, it was seven o'clock in the morning, she picked up a baguette, she had a look at it and it had a sticker on it and the words that were on there were things like grilled artichoke hearts, basil and tapenade. So I would say that the ingredients were the characteristic things that were in that product. Uh, she had a look and she said, oh, look, Daddy, I can eat those things. They're all right for me. And they agreed together that that would be suitable for her. So she ate most of the baguette. They got on the plane and we discovered afterwards that the bread dough had sesame flour in. So it wasn't sesame seeds. It was sesame flour that was therefore not uh, visible to the naked eye, if you like. Oops. Um, sorry. Let's go back. Now, the coroner... Um, wrote a report called uh, Preventing Future Deaths Report um, and he said that the sesame was unlabeled, which it was. At the time, the ingredients information had to be made available by staff at the counter, provided there was signage to invite people to ask. And with a long queue of possibly up to 100 people at seven o'clock in the morning when everybody was trying to get on a flight, um, and some debate at the inquest about the stickers that were or were not um, visible in the uh, chillers where the food was on display. Um, th these were points that the coroner wanted to make and, and, and sadly Natasha collapsed on the plane and died in Nice when she arrived. So this law was discussed by the allergy charities and the allergy doctors and this is Michael Gove uh, who was uh, I think Secretary of State for DEFRA at the time when I was at that meeting as well um, and a new law was introduced in September 2019 which comes into force on the 1st of October so 1st of October 2021 is when these rules come into force and I've references in there um, for you to look up the law if you need it and the guidance. So the baguette that she had was a status called pre-packed for direct sale. Now everything centers on this pre-packed for direct sale status. Um, so at the time, food prepared, wrapped and displayed for sale on the same site did not need to be labeled with ingredients or 14 allergens. So it was legal to put things out on display without the ingredients stuck on them provided you had a system in place to provide that information by inviting people to talk to staff. 
The information had to be, the, the signage had to be clearly legible, easily visible, and, and customers should have been able to recognise how to get the information. It had to also be accurate, consistent and verifiable. These are terms to do with making sure that it's um, available and correct always. Now, from uh, October the 1st, these foods now need to carry the name of the product or food, full ingredient list, not just the 14 allergens, but the full ingredients list, and the 14 allergens highlighted in that list in the way that they normally are. Um, so examples, uh, they have to be prepared on site. So if you're a little cafe and you're making some sandwiches to put out in a in a fridge or a display cabinet for people to pick up if you're busy later, or if you put four donuts in a box and put a sticker on to seal the box. Um, they have to be packed or wrapped and they can't be changed without undoing the wrapper. So if you have a muffin which is open, it's not pre-packed for direct sale. But if you've put four muffins in a box and, um, and that box is now closed, then they do have to be labelled. They can be items that are ready to eat, and I think that's where most of us um, imagine this applying the most. So a sandwich that's been made out the back and put in a, um, in a box, uh, a salad, uh, maybe um, uh, a box of donuts, something from the in-store bakery. Um, but actually they can be hot food as well. So hot food that's been um, either heated up in situ or heated up beforehand. And also it does apply to foods that are not ready to eat. So you can have, for example, some raw meat that's been pr processed in some way by a butcher, been marinated, or you can see here there are little um, uh, sticks and carrots and things in, in little pots. Um, so it can be a range of foods either ready to eat or not ready to eat, and they will need to have their full ingredients labeled. Now the label on the right has got quite tiny writing and I'm not sure that that writing is going to be big enough to be compliant with the new regulations because the new regulations require the small X to be 1.2 millimeters, which is actually quite a sensible sort of legibility that we need. So making this decision about how, whether something is pre-packed for direct sale, so does it come within this regulation amendment or does it not? It's to do with the time when it was ordered and prepared and the place where it was ordered and prepared. So when was it prepared? Was it prepared after the person asked for it or before the person asked for it? Was it packaged or sealed? And when or if it was put on display for sale? And also when or if it was ordered by the customer? If it was prepared after the customer ordered it, then it's not pre-packed for direct sale. But if it was put out so that anybody could pick it up, then it will be pre-packed for direct sale. When it comes to the place, it's where it's prepared. If it was made in a factory and brought into a, a, a shop or a cafe and it's all been wrapped up and manufactured and fully labelled, it's not pre-packed for direct sale. It's actually called pre-packed. Um, where was it packaged or sealed? So was it wrapped up on site or was it wrapped up off site? Um, where or if it was put on display for sale? So was it put in a place where the staff are going to pick it up with tongs or was it put up in a place where, where it's already been put in some sort of container and left for people to pick up? and where or if it was ordered by the customer. So those are the big questions. Now the Food Standards Agency has put a decision-making tool on their website and they are fine-tuning this tool and the guidance that they're putting out. And also they're working on more and more examples as people ask them more and more questions about uh, scenarios in different workplaces and different food businesses. So we just need lots and lots of examples with clear decisions so that everybody gets this because it's quite complicated.
Um, this is my model. Um, there are three sandwiches here. On the left, you have a sandwich which is obviously from a factory. It's been made off-site. It's been brought into a supermarket chiller and it's pre-packed and manufactured. And it will have everything you need. It will have all the nutrition as well as the full ingredients, the 14 allergens, the weight and all the rest of it properly, fully labelled in a manufactured way. On the right in the box, you have a sandwich that's non pre-packed. So the customer came in and said, can you do me a tuna and mayonnaise um, salad sandwich? And it's been made in front of the customer usually and packed and sealed. So after their request, so it's just been popped in the box. That is not pre-packed for direct sale. That is non pre-packed because the information would be made available by asking the staff member and the staff member should have that information available through some other route, maybe a folder or a matrix or something. It's the one at the front that we're focused on. Now this is um, a, probably a couple of years ago now, this photograph. And you can see on that front sandwich, it's wrapped up, it's got some stickers on it. So you can't open it without damaging the packaging. So that means it's potentially pre-packed for direct sale. Uh, it's been made on site, it was made in the kitchen and then put out in a chiller for people to pick up at a busy lunch hour. Somebody's handwritten cheese and tomato on it, but that is where we need more information and that is pre-packed for direct sale. So from October the, uh, October the 1st this year, that will need the name of the actual, uh, whether it's a panini or a sandwich or a baguette or whatever, the full name of it, the full ingredients list, including everything, and the allergens highlighted. So that is the sort of product that is included in this change in the regulation. Um, there are rules, and these rules are already well established um, for labeling manufactured foods, and they will need to be the same. So the name of the food, the full ingredients list, uh, you can do it in bold or italics with the 14 allergens. Um, and you need to have the small X 1.2 millimeters. Now I've already seen some of the labels on these products are extensive, they're very long lists of words, and it's very important that they are legible and that the printing is adequate. There is an exemption for tiny packets to things like chewing gum, but I don't think that will be relevant very often. So rules about labelling, labels should be well attached or stuck down. You've got to have good colour contrast to make them legible, a clear font, a good layout, not too shiny, not creased, not folded, plain background, you're not allowed to print the ingredients over a picture. Uh, put any may contain information under the ingredients and the 14 allergens list and do not cover it up with stickers because that's what happens, especially with things like in-store bakery. At the end of the day, you put... Uh, you put stickers on it saying, you know, reduced or something, and it must not cover this critical information. It's very important that we get it. Now, lastly, I was asked by Laura to mention what else is coming on the horizon in the world of food allergy. And I will mention that obviously we've got a lot of um, plant-based foods coming onto the market being developed. And I will say that the, one of the fastest growing um, foods that is uh, causing problems for people with allergies are all the legumes, including things like lentils and chickpeas and beans. And of course, these are increasingly used in these plant-based foods. It's not everybody, but a significant number of people with food allergies are having problems with these foods now. And the uh, food businesses need to be aware of this. Then there are things like kiwi and banana, which are not on the list of 14 but which are significant allergens in members of the UK population. Things like jackfruit being used partly because of its uh, texture to um, uh, make things like um, vegan burgers, vegan meat lookalike products. Um, and jackfruit is just starting to be recognized to cause allergy in some people. But above all, there's pea. And pea in this form can cause allergy, but also pea ground down to make a flour is a problem. These are freak, these are chips from Marks and Spencers, and they have pea flour in them, which you might not expect. I guess that it adds some protein and some functionality 
but we, it's very important that people appreciate that peas, beans, lentils, other legumes um, are being used in new ways and some people might have problems with them. Uh, that's the end of my session. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Hazel. Um, I think we can all appreciate this is quite a complex regulation coming into place in October, not necessarily as straightforward as we would like, but I think the, the time and place message that Hazel went through um, will hopefully help you determine what products within your own um, offerings will be affected. Um, so thank you very much, Hazel. Uh, so now we move on to Professor Louise Manning from the Royal Agricultural University. Um, Louise has a wealth of knowledge within the food integrity and food security world with over 35 years within the food supply chain industry. To give everyone a further understanding of not only why the regulation itself is important, but also in terms of just managing allergens within your business, Louise is going to provide some context and give real world examples of what happens um, when certain things happen around the world and what they can then have an impact on and how they can potentially affect um, you and your business and your um, the products that you use. So I will just um, pass over to you, Louise. Okay. Thank you. Perfect, lovely. Well, good morning, everyone. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about supply chain procurement and the Natasha's law and how it might make us reflect on our um, supply chain procedures, protocols, and where we're getting our ingredients from. So when we think of supply chains, we very often think of a simple supply chain that has a supplier, manufacturer, distributor, and then businesses uh, in food service or retailers, ultimately going to the consumer. But in reality, it's much more complex. You can get aggregation at many of the stages that were in that simple diagram. And when you're looking at some things such as allergens and allergen control and allergen management, this can become very complicated very quickly. We can think of the aggregation at each stage in the chain, but we can also think of the aspects of farmers where they may be aggregating before they move their product to local cooperatives, before they move to regional cooperatives. So if I was to take tree nuts as an example, these individual farmers who could be um, small scale farmers in um, sub-Saharan Africa, they could be large scale producers in California, they will be coming together with a whole range of products. And many of these farmers might grow a range of nut products on their farms. When we get through to your supplier and how they then look at their supply chain, they need to understand the complexity of how all these businesses work together. If we look at um, a business such as General Motors, they will map their supply chain around the world. So they'll have their tier one suppliers who supply directly to them and in this map, you can see they have their tier two suppliers that will supply their direct suppliers. If we were then to add on tier three, tier four, tier five suppliers, this map would become very complex. We can also think of our customer base and this diagram that I put into the presentation just shows the impact of the Chinese melamine incident. Although cases of um, melamine um, contamination that led to human disease only occurred in four countries. The milk powder that was associated with the product became an ingredient for a whole range of products that then became ingredients for other part processed products to then go into the final product. Um, across the world, there have been lots of guesstimates about how many products were affected and it's in the thousands. So if you are looking at your supply chain and if you are thinking about allergens specifically, 
you need to know your first tier supplier. And for many of you on this webinar, that will be Creed um, Foods. You will, they will then have a whole range of second suppliers that they engage with. And Rosie is going to talk about that a little more in a minute. But those second tier suppliers need to know all of the other suppliers in the supply chain and be clear on the potential for any allergens, either because they're an ingredient in a food or because of the risk of cross-contamination at somewhere in the supply chain. So it can get complicated very quickly. I've just put two examples on here from the last month, which show how difficult it can be for businesses that are procuring products to be able to fully understand the potential for allergen um, presence in the food. On the right hand side, you have a product recall that occurred in Australia. Why did it occur? Because for some reason, the incorrect lid was put onto that product. So the lid declares that the product is vegan, soy free, uh, dairy free, but in fact, the pot and the, the uh, um, ice cream that was within it does not comply with that lid. So that could be a simple error um, that needs to be controlled in the supply chain. On the right hand side, you have a Ben and Jerry's product, which was recalled quite recently, and it contained uh, undeclared nuts that were found during the production operation. When they look back, um, although you can see on the label it declares walnuts, there had been cross-contamination with other kinds of tree nuts at some point in that supply chain going to Unilever. So businesses need to have very clear supply chain procurement strategies, know who their tier one supplier is. Um, and also if they are buying from a range of suppliers, have some assurance of how they are managing risks in the supply chain. Because it is your suppliers that are managing your allergen risk for you, which makes them very important in your supply chain um, strategy. I put a whole set of, um, of things to think about on this slide. I'm not going to go through them all now, but what COVID has shown very, very specifically, especially where there were challenges with supply, is the risk associated with allergens and spot purchasing product. And being very clear that you know where the products are coming from, you know the level and standards of your suppliers and how they are effectively managing allergens every day. So what's my takeaway message? My takeaway message is that developing procurement strategies for your supply chain is complex. Many large businesses invest in whole teams to manage procurement and supply chain assurance of food safety and quality, but also allergens as well. If you're an SME, how do you look to your suppliers to help you to manage um, this vital food safety and public health issue? So I'm going to stop there and then um, pass over to Rosie. Brilliant. Thank you, Louise. Um, yes, that leads perfectly on in to Rosie. So last but not least, we have our technical and product data manager from here at Creed Food Service. Rosie's day to day involves um, managing product data, including allergens, nutritional and dietary detail. And the team play an integral part within the supply chain in managing and communicating any changes to our customers. So over to you. Thank you. Perfect. Yes. Thank you, Laura. Um, yeah. So I'm the product data and technical manager here at Creed Food Service and myself and my team are responsible for, for gathering the manufacturer product information um, and ensuring that that information is, is up to date and accurate as possible. And this information gets fed on to several customer platforms, including our, our online ordering system 
and um, other systems like Saffron and um, other sort of procurement systems for, for customers. So um, I've been asked today to sort of run through how Creed go about um, obtaining that information, um, identifying whether there has been a change in that product and how we go about communicating that to, to our customers. Now, um, to set the scene, um, Creed have over 6,000 products, so both at a case and a split level, um, across several different um, categories. So that's frozen, chilled, ambient, fresh, butchery and, and non-food. Um, and with that, um, each type of product has different data that, that goes with it. So an example would be sort of a food product would need um, allergen information um, and nutritional information as, as well as the dietary requirements, whereas a non-food product wouldn't need the likes of allergen information, but would need a, a cost sheet. So there's a varied amount of attributes that um, we um, apply to each product, and that's around 150 per per product and when I was running the the stats um, for the slide it was it's quite eye-opening figure that we hold about a million pieces of data um, on our on our database so quite eye-opening and sort of large amount of um, product data we, we hold and and um, need information for and we're always looking to improve our, our product data um, we did um, a lot of market research into sort of descriptions for our online ordering to just try and improve the customer experience um, so and we've done a lot of improvement in terms of our imagery um, additionally we're always looking to um, improve other areas like um, product packaging is quite key for us um, especially a trend in the market and also with new legislation coming into place um, with the HFSS legislation um, seeing where we need to gather that information in order to, to comply and help our customers um, comply their end. Um, so yeah, the information that we provide, uh, provide is imagery, descriptions, allergens, which are the 14 major allergens and, and suballergens, nutritional information. So these are the compulsory nutritionals. So that's calories, fats, saturates, carbohydrates, sugars, protein and salt, um, as well as um, other nutritional information that that supplier might um, go and test. Um, we also collect the product packaging and then also any relevant accreditation that will help to support and promote that that product so we we hold a lot of information um, and are always looking um, to develop that further so how we go about uh, collecting that information we take it from two sources um, the one is Eridus so Eridus is um, a sort of market leading source of accurate allergy nutritional and technical product data so this is taken from from their website um, they have around 843 food manufacturers um, uploading their information onto Eridus of with that like us there's about 144 wholesalers gaining that information from Eridus and using it to support their, their platforms. And then around 82,000 um, caterers and retailers also have access um, to this. So um, the process of how we um, gather and um, collate this information, we'll find that product on Erida. So this is, could be upon, upon product setup into Creed and we'll match that product but via the, the barcode. We'll then download that information and then upload into our PIM, which is a product information management system. And this system then will feed all of these third party systems like our online ordering or any other sort of relevant allergen and nutritional reporting software that, that that's out there uh, and this process is done weekly so if there are any um, slight tweaks um, or changes of descriptions um, we do a, a weekly refresh of this data to make sure we've got the most up-to-date information as possible Additionally, if the, uh, the supplier is not signed up to Eridus, we do have an attribute template which the supplier will fill in. So similar information um, as it would be um, uploaded onto Eridus. Um, and this is the likes of allergen, nutritional information, dietary requirements, uh, packaging and origin. Um, and this is completed upon a product setup and review depending on the risk of the product. And the process of this, the supplier will complete the spreadsheet, we'll do the same process and match it to our code that we have set up and then upload that information to our PIM, our product information management system. And this process is done once upon a uh, product setup, um, but then once obviously reviewed depending on, on the risk associated to it.
So it's quite interesting the split we have um, between these two um, data sources. So around 85% of our suppliers are utilizing Eridus, with 15% of our suppliers not signed up. And this is um, an ongoing uh, task for us to get more and more suppliers signed up to um, Eridus, um, just because it's um, a more centralized database in the same format and we can extract that information quite quickly. Um, and we have moved over to it actually being compulsory for suppliers to be signed up and uploading their products. So we've got 15% um, remaining um, that need to move over to, to this platform. So how do we go about identifying an allergen change? So there's four key ways um, that we do this, and this is constantly being monitored. Um, the first way is this could be a communication from the supplier. So this could have been fed into my team or our trading team or even our buying team that something has changed with the product um, and we need to, to do something internally. Additionally, there could be a product check in the warehouse. Someone has noti um, notified us that something doesn't match up to what we have on, on our system. The third way, which um, is a quite... Um, uh, pro proactive way of doing it is um, a barcode query process, which we introduced about three years ago. Um, so once we set up a product on to our system, it has a unique barcode associated to that. Our goods in um, team will go ahead and book that product um, into stock. And if the barcode doesn't match the barcode on our system, um, it will raise a, a barcode query. So, so what this means is our goods in team will notify by my team and say we've got booked in this stock today or attempted to book in this stock today and the barcode doesn't match um, our system. This product then gets put into quarantine and the issue gets escalated with my team to pass on to the, the supplier to understand what has changed because um, the barcode query, a change in a barcode is usually a key identification that something has changed with the product itself. And then the final way is um, the supplier has changed something on the system, which we review and we can see that they've changed some particular information or um, a customer has, has found a difference there. So if these, any of these ways have uh, identified a change, Creed will then apply our product change matrix. So what this means, this is just a bit of a matrix of how we know what to do next when um, a product has changed. So as you can see, there's sort of um, some uh, key areas. So it could be a product code, a barcode, description, allergens, nutritionals, or even the dietary requirements have changed. Um, and this is repeated across the top and down the side. And then the matrix basically means, do we keep the Creed product code or do we change it? So L means we keep the product code and H means we will put it on a new product code. And this is how we go about um, notifying and changing the product data over um, to be matched onto the correct code. So a few examples here, um, the supplier will notify us and say that they've changed the product code um, and we'll then dig a little bit deeper and understand why that product code has changed. In this particular example, we found that they've changed the recipe of the product. They may have wanted to reduce the salt or um, in another way to kind of improve the quality. This means uh, the product code has changed and the recipe has changed. So we put it on a new product code. Um, so the information that we have uploaded, as I've um, explained in the previous slide, uh, slide will match um, that new product code. Another example is uh, the suppliers identified that they have changed the recipe um, and once we dig a little bit deeper, the nutritional information has changed. So if you follow the, the matrix through, this once again is a uh, high risk and we put it on a new product code. As you can see, there's not many low risk lines. Um, an example would be the supplier has moved manufacturing site. There's no change to the process. They're not bringing in any new products. They're just simply changing changing the manufacturing site. Nothing's changed with the recipe. So we would keep the product code on that occasion. Another example would be they're just changing the outer branding, uh, maybe putting some, um, some other cover on the product. Um, they have confirmed in writing that nothing else has changed with the product. Um, so we would keep um, that product code. But there are very um, 
rare occasions where um, we would really keep a, a product code uh, as shown here. So um, to summarize, really, the communication is done by the product code. So once we've identified that changed uh, change, we will then create a new product code. So a new product code will be allocated onto our system. Um, that product information will be imported. So as shown on the previous slide, we'll extract it either from Eridus or even um, that supplier attribute template and we'll import that into our database. We'll then communicate that change of product code to the business and then this product code is then added to the customer contracts. And that's the end of my slide. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, that is the end of the presentation, so I will just stop sharing the screen. Um, yeah, brilliant. So as Louise said, we um, at Creed Food Service, we do recognise that we play a vital um, role within managing allergens within the supply chain. So hopefully everything Rose, that Rosie's run through um, just makes it clear and gives all of our customers confidence in how we pass on um, any changes that happen to products and recipes. Um, so that is everything from our speakers and we're actually running perfectly on time. So I will just see if we have any questions in the Q&A, which I think we do. Bear with me, apologies, my... So, and um, beforehand we did think that a lot of these might be for Hazel because we understand that there is, you know, a little bit of confusion around the products that are affected. So. Let's just run through a few of these. Um, so if we go, so an anonymous question. So as a day center, sometimes we are asked by families to provide a tea time pack for our clients that will consist of a sandwich, packet crisps and a piece of cake or a chocolate biscuit. We know our clients dietary requirements. So will the sandwiches or cake need a label? Um, so Hazel, that's probably one for you. Um, is there any more detail that you need to know or can you provide an answer for that one? Um, I think that one thing that's really important is that if the food is being prepared for a specific person rather than a random person who might be passing by, then <clears throat> sorry, the new rules don't apply because there's an inference that there's an order from the person who's got the special dietary requirement. The most important thing there, of course, is to make sure you do need a label. It's got the person's name on it or, you know, some identifier saying something to identify that it's for that person but it doesn't need the full ingredients labeling <clears throat> if it's for a specific person sorry i've got frog <laughs> no problem brilliant thank you um and i think this might be very similar but i'll just read it out just in case so regarding a school trip packet lunch which is wrapped for the trip it's ordered by the child but not a specific sandwich will this be classed as pre-packed for direct sale um i think it might be it depends if it's sealed um and also the other thing is that a lot of these scenarios depend on if anybody from the catering department is accompanying. Now on a school trip they probably aren't, but there was a question which I've already answered about a residential trip. And it sounds as though somebody from the catering department might be accompanying the trip, in which case they'll be available to give that information so they don't need to label it as PPDS. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure about a sandwich that's been prepared. Technically, if it's not sealed, then it's not within scope for the PPDS. But on the other hand, if I was on a school trip with children who might be allergic, I would really like to know exactly what was in the food. So um, perhaps the best thing to do is to make sure that the children who've got the special dietary needs, are there are extra plans for them, extra preparation for them, and uh, <clears throat> something to make sure that they get the food that's safe for them. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Hopefully that has clarified that one. Um, Rosie, looks like one for you. So as a customer, would we be told when a change has happened to a product? So I guess this just ties into your product codes. 
Yeah, so as, as mentioned, we, we do it via the product code. So once we receive an alert from the supplier that the product has changed in some way, we will change that, that product code. So what will happen is we will communicate that internally um, to uh, the relevant departments, including the, the salespeople, um, of which they will go and um, let you know that this particular product um, is effectively being delisted because it's no longer going to be within that recipe. Um, and under that product code and the new product code um, will be put um, onto your contacts uh, if, if applicable um, and if needed. Brilliant, thank you. And then Hazel, another one coming your way from Gareth. Um, so some of the parties that we host have veg and fruit platters. We'll um, prepare these at site, cut down the fruits um, for groups of 10 children. How would they display the contents of it? Um, or how are they able to have the um, spec available? And I guess that might link into whether it's covered or not. Um, but yeah, if you can help with that one. I think this is one of our dilemmas because the obvious thing for a caterer to do in that scenario would be to put some cling film over the platter. Um, and you might say, well, it's fruit. You can see, you can see what it is. It's, it's fairly obvious what it is. Um, but um, I think that if you do seal it, then you might need to label it under PPDS. Mostly these scenarios depend if you've got anybody from your catering department available when the food is served to the children. Um, and if there is somebody, then you don't need to label it. It's the risk is where food has been left with nobody owning it, if you like, with it in a chiller like the baguette at, at Heathrow. You know, there was no human nearby who would, well, there was on the counter, but nobody actually next to it. So it rather depends if anybody from the catering department is going to be dishing out the platters of fruit or whether they have been left alone in a room with nobody near them. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. Um, we've probably got time just for one or two more. <clears throat> um, so one from Richard Vincent. Um, we occasionally prepare sandwiches in our kitchen and store in fridges at the sales counter. Uh, these are not available for the customer to help themselves to and will be plated and passed to the customer by a staff member once ordered. Would these need to be labelled in any way or are we covered by staff providing information on request? I think you're covered. If you've got members of your catering team who are trained, then uh, then you're covered because they're just that's that's part of their job, isn't it? They haven't left those sandwiches. I would be very careful to make sure that they didn't get picked up by mistake by the wrong person. But if they're in in a chill, in a chiller that's in your control and they're being managed by your staff then they could be out the back, couldn't they? So it's just part of your stuff. It's when things have been left unaccompanied with no management for the customers to select that, that that's when the labeling is required. Okay, brilliant. And I think um, that is all the time um, that we have got for today's session. There are a few other questions in the Q&A box that have been submitted. So what we'll do is we will aim to um, pop answers together for those and then we can either send um, those over to the people that have submitted them directly or we will um, share as part of that follow-up email tomorrow. Um, so hopefully those questions that Hazel and Rosie have answered have provided a little bit more clarification. Um, so thank you everyone for joining today. As mentioned, you'll receive an email um, tomorrow with a link to the recording and to some additional resources, including um, the solutions that Creed offer um, to support you through this transition and to get you ready for Natasha's Law um, from the 1st of October. So hopefully uh, you've all found that helpful. Again, thank you very much to all of our speakers that have um, been involved for today. And yeah, that's everything. So thank you very much for joining everyone.